Chapter 5 deals extensively with sex determination and sex chromosomes, and there's a fair bit of material in this chapter, but for the most part, we are not going to cover uh, the vast majority of it. I want you to understand and be familiar with a number of aspects that are presented in this chapter, and I'm going to cover those in this lecture. I encourage you to follow along, read those sections in the text, and um, just focus on the material that I've presented here, um, ensuring that you're familiar with it. But the, anything else that's in the chapter, feel free to pass over. Okay. So the first thing I want to touch on is the difference between uh, mechanisms of differentiating the sex of an organism. Okay. And the first is characteristics that are utilized in sexual differentiation. Okay. And so there are two components, primary and secondary characteristics that are utilized in uh, identifying the biological sex of an individual. And primary uh, differentiation is based upon the reproductive organs themselves. Okay. So those are primary sex sexual characteristics that can be used for uh, identification of the biological sex. Secondary sexual characteristics are traits associated with a particular biological sex, but they are not what makes the organism one sex or another. So a great example from chapter four would be the feathers, uh, the feather differences of a hen and a rooster. Okay. It's not the long tail feathers that make a rooster a male, it's the, the gonads, the, the reproductive organs that make that individual a male, but there are other secondary sexual characteristics that are associated with that. Um, for humans, you know, things like a beard on a male, okay? Those, that's a, an example of a secondary sexual characteristic that can be used for uh, sexual differentiation. All right, um, a couple of other terms that I'd like to touch on that you've almost certainly encountered before, but likely not thought of in a biological sense are unisexual and bisexual. And these are important because there are organisms that we may discuss throughout this course that fall into one of these categories. And if you were thinking in the way in which these terms are used socially, uh, you might not follow along correctly. So a unisexual organism is an organism that has one set of reproductive organs. So uh, an individual dog, right? You, you have a male dog or a female dog that is a unisexual organism, okay? A bisexual organism is one that has both male and female organs, okay? So some plants have this in that they can f they produce flowers that produce uh, pollen, and then they can also accept their own pollen and produce offspring by fertilizing themselves. There are also some lizards that do this, okay? Uh, and the biological term that uh, is used with this on occasion is hermaphroditic, okay? So there are some hermaphroditic lizards that if you put one lizard on a remote island, it could produce many, many offspring and its offspring uh, produce more offspring. It could grow into an entire population just from one individual lizard simply because it is bisexual. All right, so in humans, uh, the Y chromosome is what determines the biological sex of an individual. So in my case, I have a Y chromosome, I am biologically male. In females, uh, female humans, they are female because they lack a Y chromosome, okay? And so it is the this presence or absence of the Y chromosome that determines gender. Now there are chromosomal abnormalities, and we'll talk about some of these when we get to the mutation chapter, but there are some that are specific to the sex chromosomes. And there are some associated with the Y chromosome, and there are two conditions, Klinefelter syndrome and Turner syndrome, in which an individual has a Y, but they also have two Xs, like a female. So having three sex chromosomes this is a genetic disorder. These individuals do survive, uh, but they have uh, characteristics that are um, diagnostic of this XXY genotype and that they're uh, 
quite large individuals. They have male genitalia, but they are incapable of producing sperm. Uh, individuals with Turner syndrome have an X only. They did not receive a uh, sex determining chromosome from their father. And so they uh, do not have male genitalia, uh, but they're not exactly normal biological females as well in that they're somewhat shorter, smaller chests. Uh, they do have female organs, but rudimentary uh, ovaries only. There are also uh, genotypes, other triplo uh, sex chromosome genotypes in which they have three X's or an X and two Y's, okay? And if triple X individuals might be normal or they might be somewhat underdeveloped physically, this is probably the least phenotypically different um, sexual chromosome uh, difference. And then the XYY individuals, these are individuals that have two Ys. This is somewhat sometimes called super male. Uh, these individuals are large, uh, frequently subnormal intelligence. Uh, they're big, strong, um, and interestingly, they are abundant in penal and mental institutions. And there's an interesting case study that's mentioned in your text, and it's something you might be interested in reading up further on. Uh, but there was a, a study that was begun in the 70s in which individuals with XYY were noted at birth and they began following them throughout their development because there was this interesting pattern, as I mentioned, in mental and penal institutions in which the frequency of the XYY genotype was significantly higher than in the normal population. So you can see at the top row of this table, only about 0.1% of individuals have the XYY genotype. But when you look in mental penal institutions, this frequency is 10 to 20 times or even 40 times higher, okay? Especially if you look in mental penal institutions with only looking at the taller individuals. There's a huge proportion relative to the frequency in the control population. So they started following these individuals to see uh, how they might develop and see whether this is a genotype that might have some influence on their, their life outcomes. But this is, when we, we started to be able to do this, this is when there started to be ethical questions associated with utilization of our understanding of patterns of inheritance in genetics and the influence of genetics on phenotype and behaviors because uh, they had to abandon this study due to the public outcry and basically if you have a a young child a young male that is being constantly followed and monitored for aggression and uh, everyone's hyper vigilant and focused on that individual's aggression it could lead into what you might categorize as a self-fulfilling prophecy in that they're, they, they find out, they believe that they are predisposed to this and they just go down that path. And so uh, this is just an interesting example of a sex determining or sex chromosome determining uh, phenotype that is abnormal and is something that we are able to monitor and has caused some consternation among the public. It's probably one of the earlier instances. All right, so let's talk a bit more about the X chromosome in humans because females have two X chromosomes. So does that mean necessarily that they make more of the things, the gene products that are coded for by genes on the X chromosome? So this brings us to a term called dosage compensation, okay? So since I'm a biological male, if you compared my cells to those of a, someone biologically female, we have different numbers of X chromosomes. And so presumably, if both of us are, are expressing genes found on the X chromosome, a female could express twice as much, could produce twice as much of those proteins as I can because they have twice as many, they have two of the copies of the gene in their each cell, whereas I have only one. So each cell could produce twice as much. 
So the interesting thing is, is that for most uh, of these genes found on the X chromosome in humans, that's not the case. Women do not produce twice as much of these gene products as men. And this is in part because of the formation of what we call a bar body. And a bar body illustrated here in these micrographs where we're looking at the nucleus, one of the chromosome, X chromosomes has been dyed and you can see it on the one on the far left. Basically, looking at this nucleus, all of this chromatin is in the nucleus, but all of the DNA associated with one of the X chromosomes has just been stuck over in one corner of the nucleus. This is an inactivated X chromosome. Basically one of the X chromosomes in women, in female humans, and in many female uh, organisms is inactivated and put stuffed in a corner basically. Okay, so this is called a bar body. It is a inactive X chromosome. And what it means is that women and men for most of the genes found on the X chromosome are not producing different amounts of the proteins encoded for by the genes on this X chromosome. And one interesting consequence of this is the chimeric nature of female bodies. Okay, And this theory and idea is encapsulated by the Lyon hypothesis. And basically what it means is that one of these X chromosomes is inactivated and becomes a bar body. And this happens early in embryonic development, not when there's one cell. Let's say it happens when there are a hundred cells in the zygote. So you are a, a young female zygote. You go from one cell, sperm and egg fuse, there's one cell, and you've got two X chromosomes in that one cell, and that cell divides and divides and divides, and you end up with a hundred cells. At that point, let's just say at that point, every cell turns off one of its X chromosomes. They randomly choose one of them to inactivate and stow away as a bar body for the future of that cell and all of its descendants. Well, the Lyon hypothesis refers to the independent decision, I'm gonna air quotes decision, that each of those cells makes when it inactivates one of the X chromosomes. Not all 100 of them inactivate the exact same chromosome. And so for that reason, of those 100, some inactivated the X chromosome that came from the mother and some inactivated the X from the mother. So you can think of every female human, and in this illustration, cat, being a chimera. Chimera in the sense that different parts of their body have different genetic composition because they've inactivated different X chromosomes. This is a calico cat for a reason because the coloration, orange and black, those are the results of expression of a color gene that is found on the X chromosome. But what's interesting here is that this cat is not expressing orange and black everywhere. It's expressing orange or black all over its body. Okay, and that is because the patches of its body that are expressing orange are ones where the X chromosome that had the black allele is inactivated in the bar body. And so the only color, hair color gene that is being expressed is the orange one. And patches that are black have inactivated the X chromosome that bears the orange allele. So when you see a calico cat, you know two things. You know that that cat is heterozygous for the gene that controls hair color being black or orange. It has both. And you also know it is a female because a male would express, would have only one X chromosome and would express, therefore they'd be hemizygous. They would express only black or orange. So this is a really interesting aspect of the inactivation of the X chromosome. And we're almost there already. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is temperature dependent sex determination. Okay, so while you and I, our biological sex was determined at conception by what sex chromosome was carried in the sperm that created us. Okay, 
Our father gave us either an X or a Y. In my case, I received a Y. Now, for this reason, our sex is said to be um, genetically determined. But there are some species whose sex is determined by temperature. And this is almost exclusively observed in organisms that hatch from eggs, like reptiles. So here's an example of three reptiles. So two turtles and an alligator. And you can see the three different charts illustrating the temperatures that their eggs might be incubated at. So alligator eggs incubate anywhere from 29 to 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, whereas alligator snapping turtles, the bottom left red turtle, incubate somewhere between 23 and 30 degrees. But the y-axis is the sex ratio, or percent male. So you can see that alligators, if you incubate alligator eggs at 30 degrees, you're going to get 0% male, meaning all the offspring will be female. At 33 degrees, you're going to get 100% male. Uh, you can see that these patterns, these charts, are different for different species. So Trachomy scripta, um, at low temperatures, they're all male, high temperatures, all female. So there are some really interesting patterns observed in the natural world in which the temperature might, as temperature increases, you might get fewer females, as in the top left, or you might get more females, as in the top right, or you can have, like case three here, something like we saw with the alligator, where there, in between there's a different gender bias than there was at the beginning. Oh, sorry, at the lower or higher temperatures. Okay, and then coming back to this one, I want you to think about the nests that these organisms create for their offspring. It's not like a bird nest. These organisms dig a hole and drop their eggs in a hole. So I want you to imagine all of these eggs buried in the sand incubating and think about the heat that is radiating and hitting them and realize that all of these eggs are exposed to different temperatures. And so because of this, you can end up with a pretty balanced sex ratio within the nest. Um, but it can also lead to some really interesting shifts in the abundance of males and females, especially if there are particularly hot years or particularly cold years. It can really shift the uh, frequency of the different sexes within the population. Okay, so that is the end of chapter five. Easy. <laughs>